Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Paul Mulligan, President and CEO of Catholic Education Arizona. Since 1998, Catholic Education Arizona has provided $100 million in scholarships to private Catholic school students from tax credits. Before joining Catholic Education Arizona in 2007, Paul directed the Gabriel Network in Maryland and has generously agreed to share some of his experiences with us. I'd like to thank you, Paul, for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be here. So let's talk about Catholic Education Arizona, your mission, your inception, and how you contribute to the education of students uh, at Catholic schools. Great. Well, here in Arizona, we have a very unique program supporting uh, numerous um, uh, avenues of educating your children. Everybody obviously knows about public schools. Arizona was one of the first states to adopt charter schools, and they're quite established now with a couple of decades now of experience with, Catholic, with uh, charter schools. Um, since 1998, the state of Arizona has actually had a tax credit available for uh, supporting children in private schools using a, a special government incentive. And so using a tax credit, essentially anybody paying state of Arizona taxes can get a rebate, if you will, on the donation that they make to our program. Our particular 501c3 organization was started with a Catholic philosophy, and we really do believe that those that need the funds the most should get the first helping. And so we've operated that way since 1998, and as you said, $100 million later now, here we are, entering our 14th year, continuing to provide funds primarily to low-income students who couldn't otherwise uh, afford to attend our schools. So you have people who are contributing to the organization for the funding of Catholic schools, um, and they get a tax credit from that. That creates a, a, an endowment or a fund that you then distribute? That's correct. The state uh, uh, set up these organizations called school tuition organizations. That's the formal name of this entity. Required to be 501c3, so everybody that knows nonprofits knows that well, um, but uh, with a specific kind of a state flavor to them. And these school tuition organizations are required by law to allocate at least 90% of their revenues uh, each year to scholarships. So you do tend to have a very good kind of percentage of, of operations versus uh, program. We do a great job keeping our expenses at Catholic Education Arizona traditionally under 5%. Our lifetime average is just about that. Uh, so we've done a great job at actually getting the revenues that we collect right out in the field as scholarships uh, for these kids. And uh, do your revenues shift year to year or are they fairly stable? They've kind of grown because the original limits of the tax credit were smaller. Um, and then finally in 2006, uh, sort of the marriage penalty, if you will, was removed. And so it's a $500 per taxpayer credit that's available. So married couples can do $1,000. So new this year is a uh, Senate bill which was signed into law by Governor Brewer, which actually created an additional tax credit. So another $500 and $1,000 available for those that have the liability to take advantage of a tax credit, again, for these private schools. Now, you are also out there raising funds and drawing attention to this tax credit. So uh, tell us about how that actually functions, or do you just wait for the money to, to, to come in? Sure. Um, I should mention at this point, there's actually two sources of revenue for us. So individuals, um, as individual Arizona taxpayers, have been able to take advantage of this special individual tax mm -hmm. credit since 1998 was really the first year we fundraised. Uh, and in 2006, the state also passed a corporate tax credit legislation. In that particular piece, uh, actually the, the law mandates that low-income families receive the money. It's a means test. In our case, as I mentioned, our whole organization, our philosophy is that the low-income families, those with the greatest financial need, are going to get the money first. So it works really well for us. We run both programs effectively the same, but, but technically the state uh, does mandate uh, in the corporate tax credit that low-income students be the beneficiaries. Um, we raise money, therefore, from both of those sectors, from individuals and from corporations. And so um, kind of our, our timeline, if you will, in the marketing is really governed by the state tax year. Uh, we were fortunate enough in 2011 to have an extension. Most of your nonprofit giving tends to happen at the end of the year on a 1231 giving deadline. It had been that way with uh, school tuition organizations as well until last year. An, uh, an extension was granted by the state and in a new piece of legislation that allows taxpayers to wait until April 15th to be able to get their individual tax credit. So we, uh, we raised about 70% of our funds from individuals prior to December 31st, and the remaining funds came after December 31st. Uh, so clearly we are able to get people now into that tax mindset 
of almost waiting until you do your taxes, find out if you have any liability, and then encouraging people, hey, this is a great decision you know, for you to consider making with your tax liability. You know how much the state's going to collect from you? Why not consider blessing some low-income family with the opportunity to go to a, a really great school? Are you able to triangulate who your donors are uh, through this uh, tax credit program? Do you know whether these are people with children, not with children? Um, older people, people of wealth. We tend to get a very charitably minded donor. Um, the legacy giver is a pretty common one. So somebody that's, you know, maybe up in their 60s and 70s, um, who doesn't have kids, maybe has grandkids and so forth in the schools, that would be a, a pretty good profile of a donor for us. Well, there's about 50 school tuition organizations, but just a handful of us sort of share this uh, philosophy in, in kind of the needs-based funding. In other words, they're, they're not directing who the exact beneficiary is. Other programs do allow for that, um, and of course we don't. You know, here we are raising uh, last year $12.6 million. Well, that money's going to go out to low-income families. Other school tuition organizations don't necessarily have that philosophy, so um, the profile of the donors is quite different. In our case, we tend to find that uh, we do have um, actually a lot of legacy-minded donors. We have donors that are coming to us from Sun City. They don't have kids. Maybe they grew up in the Midwest. They had uh, the benefit of a Catholic education. It used to be much more affordable when they went to school, and they don't want to see other kids miss out on that. And describe your organization, uh, how many staff there are, um, uh, how you operate, what the roles and responsibilities are that are sure. incorporated into the Well, the actually, because of this overhead issue um, that the state kind of mandates a, a very high payout, and we think it's great, by the way, uh, to kind of insist that the vast majority of the money the state would otherwise collect be directed right out there to programs. So, um, so that 90% requirement going out the door in scholarships tends to keep most organizations pretty lean on staff. In our particular case, we have myself and two other senior staff members, and then we have a person answering the phones. So, I mean, there's really four of us in the operation. Um, we get some assistance seasonally from somebody to help us enter some donations in. But it's a, you know, when, when you think about 10, 12 million dollar operations, you usually think about more people. Uh, what we've done, I think, effectively, but with a lot more growth potential ahead of us, is we've, we've rallied volunteers into the program. Uh, this is something I'm, you know, personally experienced with. Uh, my, you mentioned my previous uh, work with Gabriel Network, which was kind of a community-based pregnancy support group, and we were entirely driven by uh, com committees, really, of church-based volunteers. We would just have people that felt connected, committed to the cause. We equipped them with a model that worked for them and gave them roles to play, concrete, tangible roles and a little bit of accountability. Uh, we're doing that same kind of thing here in our program. And what's interesting is we serve 40 schools. We've got about 6,000 kids almost on scholarship out of the 12,000 kids in our Diocese of Phoenix schools. Our most effective programs are actually ones that are led by volunteers. So we do have paid staff in the schools that do development for a living. They're managing golf tournaments and auctions and you know, all sorts of different things. And then here's this tax credit that's bringing in some schools getting a quarter million dollars from, from this for their kids. It's a huge, hugely important aspect of their fundraising, and yet uh, they, they may not give it the full attention that it could get. And that's where our volunteer-led committees have just been uh, saving grace for us. I mean, and we're talking, you were asking about profiles. We're talking about people on this committee are folks that don't get benefit from the program. They don't monetarily receive. These are folks that philosophically think the tax credit's a great thing, they like to see the money stay local, and, uh, and they really believe in the power of this program. So the ones I'm dealing with that are most effective programs, many of them don't even have children, and yet they are out there kind of leading the way, carrying the water uh, to get, get an effective kind of community-based tax credit program going. So maybe the benefit that they are receiving is not a selfish one. Correct. Yeah, I, in fact, I think that's really a hallmark of the whole program. If you, if you look at the landscape of, of how these organizations operate, uh, not surprisingly, I mean, parents have a very vested interest in seeing their kids get a good education, and so oftentimes a lot of the promotion happens from parents who may directly receive benefit from the sales. Ours is already kind of a group mentality. We're raising money for a community, not for individuals in the sense of, you know, hey, I want you to sponsor this particular child. Well, what if he doesn't need the money? Well, that's not really important. In our case, it, what's important is that we have a community with a lot of financial need. There was $26 million of financial need among our applicants, and we paid out about $12 million in awards, which is a phenomenal uh, you know, number, and yet we still have this $14 million differential we're trying to overcome, and until we can, we've got a lot of families that would love to choose Catholic education, quality schools, great results, but they just can't afford it without the proper financial aid. 
Now, you have to navigate some pretty controversial terrain in certain respects. There's the religious affiliation side of this of right. this discussion. There's the private school uh, versus public school side of the discussion. There is the um, the whole question about education and the, how do you na how do you navigate all these different uh, questions and and controversies uh, that surround these types of programs? Um, I think it's a great question. Frankly, I like to get right out in front on those kinds of issues and, and not pretend there's nothing to see here. Um, these are really valid um, concerns, objections, frankly, that people have, is they want to know money that the state would be collecting. Um, you know, how come these private school kids and these private school families and so forth are benefiting? I'm a taxpayer too, and I, and I think that kind of accountability is, uh, is necessary. But I can tell you confidently, it's, it's great to be able to have a, a good, solid response for people, and it's a provocative one. Uh, and that's why we have major companies, you know, major companies that everybody would recognize that are supporting uh, Catholic schools, and you mentioned religious issues and so forth, they feel quite comfortable. So I think in terms of navigating these issues, number one, you have to kind of know really what, what those objections are. So take, for example, religious schools. Um, the Supreme Court, frankly, just looked at this whole case itself, and it's, it's quite clear it's not. What's, what's happening here, the way that this tax credit program is devised, is the money is going to individual families, individual school children that apply. And so it's not something that's really going to a religious institution. Um, so we've kind of dealt with that, which is nice. But, you know, the issue about, hey, should our company, should myself and my wife be supporting maybe a, quote, religious school or private school? Um, and I'll tell you, what's great is, and I think, frankly, the culture in a certain sense gives a great witness to us, is there's just a lot of need right now for, especially our youth, to find that kind of direction or mission in their life. And um, certainly studies show, I know Michael Crow at ASU, for example, he's very big in, in pulling in kids from religious private schools. And the reason he says is that these kids that are coming from, uh, from homes where religion is either practiced or supported, somehow it's... it's uh, endorsed and appreciated and so forth, those kids just do better. They seem to be a little more mission driven, they know what they're after, and, uh, and, and the results are actually evident in the classroom. So from his, his own marketing at ASU, he looks at certain programs out here in the valley, looks at a number of our schools as feeder schools and says, you know, I know that a kid coming from this school is going to do very well at ASU. And that's not really to say that, uh, you know, a child that's religious oriented is necessarily uh, going to do better, but when you think about what our institutions are doing, they're really instilling uh, character discipline, values, and these are common values. These are really things that folks that are not even religious can appreciate. Respect for your neighbor, service, uh, looking out for those in need and so forth. Great values to instill in our kids. And I think therefore that religious aspect that can be a bit controversial or people can look at and say, is this where our company would want to invest? And we can kind of overcome that by showing this quality result. Who attends the Catholic schools in Arizona? Yeah, you know, um, people are often surprised to hear that actually anybody can attend the, these Catholic schools. We have a fairly diverse population now. Granted, they're, they're probably the, the school of first choice for most of our Catholic families, um, but we've, we've got this great track record of just doing a great job on education and so forth. So uh, we have a lot of folks from other religion and no religion at all that, that attend our schools. There is no sort of faith test or religious requirement to get into the schools. And that's been, again, another selling point when we talk about selling this program to corporations. Hey, they like knowing that everybody has the opportunity to benefit from it. A lot of low-income families, a lot of minorities, these are the kids that are really the, uh, the, the, the ones that are getting most of the support right now through our program. And if we had enough revenue coming in, we could get enough individual taxpayers and corporations on board that agreed with the philosophy of what we're doing. I'm sure we could provide a lot more support. But uh, right now, nearly 50% of the kids in the schools are, are qualifying for and receiving aid from us. The reality is that a lot of people really do like seeing those kids in uniform in their neighborhood because those are the kids that are taking care of other people, and they're the kids that are on their way to, you know, with uh, tremendous graduation rates, 99% of our kids graduating, 97% going on to college. This is the future tax base. These are the guys you'd like to bring into your company because they've got good values, they're going to be ethical employees, and they're competent. You know, so um, again, that'd be an example of something we can, we can sort of message properly and, and people can understand it, and it's, and it's showing in the revenues. Do you feel that the tax credit should be expanded beyond where it is right now? So instead of those traditional models, well, well, we live in this zip code, so you know, our child will go to these schools. What if the schools are failing? What if I want something else for my child? Do I have any options? Arizona's done a very nice job at kind of introducing those options, making them available, and they've used legislation in various capacities to, uh, to do that. Um, I mentioned, though, I think that this tax credit is probably a stepping stone. Um, ultimately, you're already seeing certain, you know, looking over the horizon, 
um, with these empowerment savings accounts, these education savings accounts um, that are now in place for displaced disabled children. These are essentially, um, you know, allows families to be able to go to their district and get an award. 90% of what the district would spend on their children, they can get that and use it at any school that they want for their children. So they get to decide what's the best school, not just what the district says is the best school. It's empowered families to do that. And I think that's probably where ultimately private education is going, is, is towards some kind of model like that. And I'm sure the constitutional challenges will be there for sure. It might be another decade like it was for our tax credit before we get this resolved, but I do kind of see this as sort of a stepping stone. But in the meantime, I do think the tax credits are working, um, especially the way that we apply them. I mean, the kids that we're, we're supporting on this kind of thing, we talk about an average tuition award coming from the tax credit of around $2,000 to get a child in one of our seats. The state is spending about $9,000 a head. And so when you think about the trade-off of keeping a child or allowing a child to stay in or come into, for example, a Catholic school, the state taxpayers are getting a huge win on this. Who bears the rest of the cost for the child's education? So the parents are, are possibly coming in with something, with a portion of it. Right. Um, virtually everybody pays something. We have Catholic parishes around here that are subsidizing you know, several hundred thousand dollars to help run the schools. So the plate collection money that's going out from, from people to just come to church on Sunday is covering some of the operating costs of that school. What the opponents of the legislation say is that, hey, the state needs this money. Uh, we, we're giving up $55 million from individuals through this tax credit program, and the state needs that money, and the schools are being shorted. But the calculation, uh, we had a guy named, um, uh, I forget his first name, but Dr. North from Baylor University that came in and did an independent study on the subject, and basically determined that somehow, um, looking at all the organizations, not just ours, but looking at all the organizations and data and assumptions and all the modeling that they could do, this program is saving the state of Arizona somewhere between about nine and $240 million a year, uh, depending on how you do that math and depending on what your starting points are and so forth. So between but nine and $240 million a, a year, year in savings to the state's general fund by allowing effectively the state to outsource the job of education to more cost-effective Catholic and other private schools. So there's a range between nine hundred and nine and two hundred and forty million. Love the range. I mean, that's, oh, hey, no, I love this. But it's a, it's, I, I it's understand. It's a phenomenal what study that has that has a range that is, uh, you know, <laughs> sure. Let, oh, no, I, I love the 30, way this works. Thirty times, or, or and the, and, the, and again, that's that's looking at a variety of different factors. This whole thing, but but let me tell you, for example, the calculus on our schools, and again, that's mm -hmm. because our schools. Our schools and our program is a school a program that is actually focusing on these low-income families that couldn't otherwise afford it. So when you do the trade-off um, in, in our math, we're somewhere around $40 million of savings to the state coffers based on the number of kids, these 6,000 kids that we've got in our, in our program, that without tax credit support are going to cost the taxpayers about $9,000 each. Instead, they cost the taxpayers about $2,000 each. Now, does that math make sense? It seems to me that let's take the $9,000. The $9,000 is what society is deciding to contribute, and that's our tax dollars. So we give our money to, to the government. The government then gives it to the school system. Right. In this alternative, we give $2,000 from the in, in, in taxes that get passed through to, to Catholic schools, and then the rest of the, the costs come also from us. We're, we're paying with it philanthropically, it's, it's uh, paid by the parents in fees. Correct. The cost to society is going to be whatever that full cost is going to be. So w we seem to be having that's a, voluntary cost, a bit of a, right, yeah, that's we, a voluntary cost. We have a, we have a bit of a, a discussion about voluntary versus uh, involuntary through the tax system. Um, but the mathematics to me seems to be that it's the full cost of educating a child through the public school system and the full cost of educating a child through these private Catholic schools. In terms of the root, how things are done, I think there are lots of different approaches. Different approaches can be equally valid, they can work, they can be complementary, they don't necessarily need to be antagonistic to each other. I'm, right, right. I'm really commenting on, on the mathematics. Sure. Um, well, I think the, the reality that, uh, that um, Arizona taxpayers would have to deal with is that if we can't keep these in uh, this year, let's say 5,240 kids getting a scholarship through the tax credit in our program this year, um, if we can't keep those kids in our classroom, the, the, the cost to the 
you know, to our state, to the tax taxpayers of the state and so forth, they're going to have to cover the, the, the cost right now that they currently don't have to cover. And what's the difference on that? Well, right now, we trade that $2,000 scholarship that we're getting, you know, making sure these kids get something through the tax credit program. Um, we're going to now assume a $9,000 overhead. Now, you're right. Those individual families got to come up with money, parish communities. So there's no question. I'm not saying the cost is $2,000, but what I'm saying is what the state general fund is going to give up versus what the state will save, those numbers are valid. I mean, that, those are the actual reported numbers, Department of Revenue and so forth that uh, are, you know, you can validate. Um, and then the philosophy of it, obviously. I mean, you know, should the state have this? Is it, if there's a better way to do it? I mean, this is where I think charters have kind of come a long, a long way in Arizona is because people do look at charters. They are public schools, but they're just public schools that are a little less bureaucratic, a little more local control. And so the allocation for a kid to be in a public school from the tax general fund is somewhere around $7,000 a head. So even having a kid move from a public school to a, a public charter school saves the state taxpayers money. We're, we're just the next step of that. We're the one that actually, um, you know, on an allocation of about $2,000 of what would be state revenue, we can get the job done. And I love to kind of get out there with those graduation rates because um, we've got a million kids in public schools. We need the public schools to work. You're never going to hear us say anything other than that. We want good public education because that's where most of Arizona's kids are going to go. Um, it's just great that we do have a program that doesn't need reform, that doesn't need fixing in our Catholic schools and some other you know, established private schools out there. Um, we don't need to fix anything. You just need to get a kid in the seat, and we can tell you what that trajectory is going to look like, and we can almost guarantee those results. Kids going to college you know, uh, is going to be a productive member in that regard. You're going to hopefully bring some values with them and so forth, and we're all going to win from that. And I'll tell you, it would be a harder argument to make if we had to say, well, it's going to cost the state taxpayers a lot of money. I'm on the fortunate side of being able to say, we can save you some money as well. So you're asking about the kind of the, how do you deal with issues like private public schools. I think the facts are very favorable for us and I think when people understand that this is a great win for Arizona, I think this is why it has expanded. The only objection we've really had to this program um, has been kind of a philosophical one from the, from the teacher's lobby, if you will, because you know the, the budget for the schools are largely determined by the number of seats filled. And has this, re has this program resulted in a, st in a strengthening of, of Catholic schools throughout the, 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 the state? You know, actually, it's interesting because nationwide, Catholic schools are, uh, frankly, they're disappearing. Um, this tuition issue, when, when Catholic schools made the jump from uh, religious, you know, that were teaching and so forth, so you had the priests and the nuns and so forth that were um, obviously pretty affordable staff to maintain because they were working for nothing. Um, you, could, you could run a school and keep the tuition down pretty low. Since uh, we've had the declining numbers of religious and we've kind of got much more uh, laity and leadership positions, especially in the schools, and they're almost entirely lay-run schools now, you have to be competitive with your other neighborhood schools. You're going to provide a good product. So we have had significant increases in the operating costs of our schools. So like I mentioned, those Sun City donors, you know, when they went to school, some of them were paying 10 bucks a month for tuition, you know. Uh, they're pretty shocked when they hear how much it costs to actually educate, and they don't know why. Well, the reason is because we don't have father so-and-so and, -so and sister so-and-so running the schools. We've actually just got to get some good competitive lay faculty. So um, nationwide, you've seen a lot of reduction in, in uh, Catholic schools. Um, there have been some big announcements lately. New York did a consolidation. Philadelphia just announced the Archdiocese. They're shutting down 48 schools there. Uh, they just did that recently in Baltimore. Chicago's had a whole remapping of their school system as well. And the demographics, demographics have just kind of gotten away from them. There just aren't, the, there's not the support available in those neighborhoods to run those schools. We, however, have been pretty insulated. I think that's been the difference. We're not growing our schools right now, but we're not losing them. We're hanging on to what we've got so we can keep those schools operating in those neighborhoods and continue to make it available. I think it could still be a lot better. What plagues us is that we just have a pretty low participation of those folks that are paying taxes, that don't really know what a tax credit is or how it benefits them. They may believe in Catholic education, but they haven't put it together yet that this is a great way to support Catholic education, get some great results out there in the community for these kids, uh, and it doesn't cost you anything out of pocket. It's a tax credit. So that's really what our uphill challenge is. But happily, we've been able to kind of stand against the tide of what's happening nationally. And so, you know, in, in many ways, this has been a model program. People, the bishops and others, are looking at tax credits as, you know, hey, maybe this is something that the states can look at, make sense of, and and certainly the school choice kind of movement has expanded here over the last few years. I think the fiscal budgets these states are dealing with, there, there are a lot of challenges on them, whether they can continue to do business the way they did. They're looking at states like Arizona as a model to say, hey, maybe we can effectively outsource some of this education at a lower cost and save our, our state budget some money. Well, Paul Mulligan, thank you so much for sharing, uh, sharing with us this, this 
uh, extraordinary model um, of how nonprofits can work within the education system. Uh, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks.